I'm in 2 Kings 21, and we are really getting down to the last few kings. You get to 2 Kings 21, and it's King Manasseh. And I've done several studies on this guy before in the past eight years or so. And he's one of the most wicked kings. Really, he looks like the most wicked king, but there's a twist as you'll get, we'll get to. <clears throat> so this is King Manasseh, and he's the 13th king of Judah, if you don't count Queen Athaliah. If you count her, he's 14th. But if you don't count her, he's 13th. And Manasseh means causing to forget. And he reigns a long time, 55 years. That's a long time. That's longer than most of you have probably been alive. But he reigned 55 years. His spiritual state is evil. Tribe is Judah. His parents are Hezekiah and Hephzibah is his mother, Hephzibah. His prophets are Isaiah and Jeremiah. His age at death is 67. He's known for being one of the most evil kings. He's known for human sacrifice. He's, he's known for the longest reign of Judah. And his verses that talks about him in his text verses is 2 Kings 21, 1 through 18, and 2 Chronicles 33, 1 through 20. And I hope to get to both places. But if I don't, I'll just break it up into two parts. But Manasseh here, in verse 1, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. And how could somebody that's 12 years old reign? How could he have enough wisdom to reign? But he reigned at 12 years old and reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hephzibah. And her name means my delight, Hephzibah. So Manasseh, being 12 years old, right here, he, was, he would have been born in the 15 years that was added to Hezekiah's life back there in chapter 20, verse... Um, in chapter 20 and verse 6... The Lord tells Hezekiah, since he prayed, I will add unto thy days 15 years. So he gives Hezekiah 15 years. And look, Manasseh's 12. So Manasseh was born during those 15 years that Hezekiah got added to his life. So if Hezekiah would have went on and died, the most wicked king, Manasseh, would have never even been born. Now, he, he named him Manasseh. That means causing to forget. Possibly Manasseh, uh, Hezekiah wanted to forget about all that sickness he went through. And like I said, 55 years, that's the longest reign of any king. And he's the third youngest king behind Joash, which was seven years, Second Chronicles 24.1, and Josiah, who was eight years old. 2 Kings 22 1. Now, I got an eight year old right now, and I can't imagine if she was queen, I'd be in big trouble. But Manasseh, he didn't get much training from Hezekiah because he died when he was young. Hezekiah died when, he, when uh, Manasseh was young. So. Hezekiah didn't get mu uh, much of a chance to train up his child in the way he should go, you see. So maybe that's something that contributed to Manasseh being such an evil king after such a great king. Hezekiah was a great man, a great king. Manasseh, he's in rough shape. So you got to think, too, you know, you, you constantly judge people when you see their kids. And I don't do that because you could have great parents, but you're forgetting kids have a free will. Having a being a good parent doesn't automatically make a good kid. Being a bad parent doesn't automatically make make a bad kid. 
Now you want to remember that not to judge people based on their kids. And I know the older generation loves to do that. They love to sit in judgment of you if you got a bad kid. But that's just not always the case. That doesn't always make mean you're a bad parent because you've got bad kids. And it says in 2 Kings 21, 2, And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, after the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. So look at that phrase. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And that's one of the phrases that goes along with most of these kings. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. Rarely do you see it say, and he did good that he did that which was good in the sight of the Lord. Look, pretend for a minute that you had a chapter written about you. Because you are a king as a Christian. He's he's made us kings and priests. Insert your name here instead of Manasseh, put your name there. Is it going to say, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, or he did that which was good in the sight of the Lord? You don't want it to say, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, after the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. You don't want it to say you acted like a heathen all your life. But he's look at these abominations of the heathen here. In Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 12, let's look at them. Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 12. Let me show you the abominations of the heathen. It says, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do those things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. So Manasseh, that's what he was involved in, was all this wicked occult stuff. And I imagine his you, you go into his mansion and in his palace, and you go into his library, a bunch of wicked writings, occult writings in there. And it says in Second Kings 21, 3, For he built up again the high places. See, he's building up what his father tore down. He's going backwards. He's not making progress. He's going backwards. He built up again the high places. You know, the high places I've told you about many times throughout these studies, the high places was these where they would go to worship their false gods. And high places, I believe, because, you know, that we there's spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, the devil likes high things. He likes to be the most high. So high places... For he built up again the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed, and he reared up altars for Baal, a false god, and made a grove, you know, a grove, a, a tree, a, a tree area where there's a lot of trees where they could get under the shadow of them trees and worship their idols, because men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. And made a grove, as did Ahab king of Israel, and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. So the host of heaven, the sun, the moon, the stars, into astrology, all that type of thing. He's got his, he set his affection on things above, but not high enough. He's got his affections on the second heaven. You need to have it on the third heaven. He worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord. But these weren't good altars. This isn't what the Lord wanted. This is altars for false gods. I wish the Lord said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. And that's, you know what that's a picture of? You see, back in the Old Testament, they had a physical house where they came to, visit, to worship. In the New Testament, your body's the temple. Your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost. And what he's doing here. By putting these altars for false gods in the house of the Lord, he is defiling the temple. And when you live wickedly and do whatever you want to do, 
you're defiling your temple. And it says in 1 Corinthians 3.17, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God de destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. And 1 Corinthians 6, if you look at 1 Corinthians 6.19, what know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with the price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. First, First Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. What he's doing here pictures you defiling your temple. And in verse 5, 2 Kings 21, 5, And he built altars. For all the host of heaven and the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he made his son pass through the fire. Child sacrifice there. And observed times. There's your astrology. And used enchantments. See he's all into this witchcraft stuff. Using enchantments. And dealt with the familiar spirit. Dealt with familiar spirits. So he's talking to... Uh, unclean spirits that would be familiar with uh, maybe your loved ones, maybe his loved ones that's went on, and you know they'll pretend to be his loved ones that's went on, and so he's involved in that. Familiar spirits, you know, necromancy, talking to the dead, familiar spirits, and wizards. You know, like the you know, wizards would have been guys that were. Uh, doing witchcraft and stuff out of books that they've learned how to do it with. You know, they were bookish. Wizards were. And they would have these books where they would get their magic and spells out of. So like I said, I imagine you go in his library. I bet that thing wrapped around the room with just wizardry books. And he wrought much wickedness on the side of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And Imagine provoking the Lord God of heaven to anger. Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to go from King Hezekiah's kingdom that was for the Lord to Manasseh's kingdom? And it says, And he set a graven image of the grove that he had made in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. So he takes this graven image of the grove and he puts it in the house of the Lord. You see, he's got a graven image of the grove. So a grove can, can be a carved image made from the trees of the grove or it can be talking about the grove itself. But what this is, is like a He's made an image out of one of those trees of the grove and he put it in the house of the Lord. How much more disrespectful can you get? But you see, Hezekiah made progress. Manasseh's just taken them backwards. And you need to learn from your father's good accomplishments. You know, he had a good father. That's a rare thing that the king has a good father and he didn't learn from his good his father's good accomplishments you need to learn from your father's good accomplishments and you need to stay away from your father's mistakes imagine if king hezekiah would have seen him building these altars rearing up altars for baal you know he would have manasseh would have known about those baalite priests or prophets back there who you know were cutting themselves when when they were trying to take on Elijah you see those bell bellite worshipers were devil possessed first kings 18 26 through 28 they were cutting themselves just like the maniac of Gadara in the gospels and Manasseh being the 13th king if you don't count Athaliah He's got 13 evil things that he does that brings the nation down. You know, you think about the sins of David. The sins of David didn't bring the nation down. It, it gave the enemies occasion to blaspheme, but he didn't lead the whole nation into wickedness. What Manasseh's doing led the whole nation into wickedness. Look at these 13 things. He built up again the high places. 
He reared up altars for Baal. He made a grove. He worshipped the host of heaven. He built altars in the house of the Lord. He built altars for all the host of heaven. He made his son pass through the fire. He observed times. He used enchantments. He dealt with familiar spirits, wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He set a graven image of the grove they had made in the house. Thirteen evils that brought this nation down. And what he did foreshadows the abomination of desolation. Matthew twenty four fifteen, Second Thessalonians two, three through four, Daniel eight thirteen, Revelation thirteen fifteen. The Antichrist will also do human sacrifices as well. You know, Manasseh's picture in the Antichrist here a little bit. You know, he's not one of the eighteen types of Antichrist that Bible believers always give, but he's looking like a picture of the Antichrist to me. And possibly one of the worst kings Judah ever had. And it says in verse 8, Neither will I make the feet of Israel move any more out of the land, which I gave their fathers, only if they will observe to do according to all that I have commanded them and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. So he says, Neither will I make the feet of Israel move any more out of the land, See, in the millennium, they're going to get their land without fear of losing it. In the Old Testament, they had to keep the commandments to stay in it. But nothing can change that promise that God gave to Abraham that they are going to get the land and it's going to be theirs forever. But in the Old Testament, they only got to stay in it if they observed to do according to all that I commanded them. And that's not what Manasseh's doing. He's not doing and he's leading the people to not doing all that's commanded. He's leading the people away from the law and getting them into all this occult stuff and having them do what the heathen do. And it says in verse 9, but they hearkened not. They didn't listen. And Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. Manasseh, their leader, he's doing worse than that abominations of the heathen and leading the whole nation into it his evil even went beyond the nations living in canaan before israel took possession of it look at jeremiah turn to the book of jeremiah chapter 15 1 through 4 jeremiah 15 1 it says then said the lord unto me though moses and samuel stood before me Yet my mind could not be toward this people. Cast them out of my sight, and let them go forth. And it shall come to pass, if they say unto thee, Whither shall we go forth? Then thou shalt tell them, Thus saith the Lord, Such as are for death to death, and such as are for the sword to the sword, and such as are for the famine to the famine, and such as are for the captivity to the captivity. And I will appoint over them four kinds, saith the Lord, the sword to slay, and the dogs to tear, and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the earth to devour and to destroy. And I will cause them to be removed into all kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for that which he did in Jerusalem. Manasseh's taking them down. He's a seducer. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And Manasseh was this bad way back then. Imagine what they're like now. If they wax worse and worse, Manasseh, one of the wickedest kings in the entire Bible, worse than the heathen even. It says, but they hearken not, and Manasseh seduced them, just like the devil would do, just like a false prophet would do. And seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spake by his servants the prophets. You know, he spake by the prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Joel, Nahum, Habakkuk. All those prophets you have that would prophesy to these kings and to, to, to the nation. To get them to try to get back on track. 
And the Lord spake by his servants the prophets, saying, Because Manasseh king of Judah hath done these abominations, and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did, which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols. And the, the Amorites is a, a, a general designation of the original inhabitants of Canaan. And he did even more wickedly than them. He was over much wicked. Ecclesiastes 7.17, he was over much wicked. Therefore, verse 12, Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. Once they hear the evil that the Lord's going to bring up on them, their ears are going to tingle. It's going to freak them out. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plumb of the house of Ahab. And I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth the dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. So Manasseh, uh, Manasseh is ca causing the Lord to bring this wrath upon the, on Judah. And the Lord, it says, I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria. So he's going to measure Judah with the same line he used on Samaria. And Samaria, it's talking about the northern kingdom, Israel. You know, with the, had King Ahab and all them other wicked kings. He's going to use the same line that he measured Samaria with. He's going to measure Judah with. And he's going to do to Judah the same thing that he did to them. You see, there are, they already went into captivity. And he's going to put the same judgment on the, on Judah as he did the northern kingdom. He's going to you. He's going to level it to the ground. You see that where it says plummet, he says, and the plummet of the house of Ahab. So a plummet that's an instrument used by carpenters to adjust things to a perpendicular line, and they weigh them down and they drop them from walls to see whether they were structurally straight. He's going to take the plummet of the house of Ahab. He's going to measure Jerusalem with the same thing he used to measure Samaria. They're going to be uh, found wanting. They're going to be found l lacking what's needed to stay in the land because they're not observing to do all the commandments that God told Moses. And he's going to take Jerusalem and he's going to wipe Jerusalem as a man wipe at the dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. See, when a man wipes a dish and gets it dry, he wipes the top, then turns it over, looks at it and wipes the bottom to make sure it's dry. I don't know if it's true or not, but they say when a woman wipes a dish, she wipes the top and then she doesn't turn it over. She wipes it while it's still facing up. When a man wipes a dish, he wipes the top then turns it upside down and wipes it. And that's what the Lord is going to do to Jerusalem. It says in verse 14, And I will forsake the remnant of mine inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies, and they shall become a prey and a spoil to their enemies. You see, they got away, you get away from the Lord, He's going to let enemies rise up and be a thorn in your flesh, just like He raised up adversaries to king solomon it says because they have done that which was evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came forth out of egypt even unto this day it says moreover manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled jerusalem from one end to the other he was shedding innocent blood well he was doing child sacrifice how much more innocent can you get how much more innocent blood can you get? And in Proverbs 6, 16 through 17, hands that shed innocent blood is one of the things the Lord hates. And Judah was filled with it from one end to the other. And it says, Beside his sin wherewith he made Judah to sin in doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. All the stuff he was doing was in the sight of the Lord. And it says, Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and all that he did and his sin that he sinned are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? That's in Second Chronicles 33, which we're going to go to. 
And Manasseh slept with his fathers and was buried in the garden of his own house in the garden of Uzzah. And Ammon his son reigned in his stead. Now, Second Chronicles 33 has the twist. So you want to stick around for Second Chronicles 33. Now we're going to get into the twist at the end of Manasseh's life. And I love a good twist. Second Kings 21 didn't tell you about it. That's the value of reading the whole thing because you wouldn't have known about this if you didn't read Second Chronicles 33. So we're going to go through Second Chronicles 33 and get more detail. Second Chronicles 33, 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. And we have done talked about that awfully young guy born three years after Hezekiah's recovery and in the seventh year of Hezekiah's reign. And obviously he didn't have much time with Hezekiah because Hezekiah died when he was young. And maybe his, his mother Hephzibah just didn't lead him the right way. I don't know. But um, if you don't count Athaliah, he's the 13th king of Israel. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast up before the children of Israel. And you would think that, you would, he would think, hey, you know, the Lord killed all these heathen nations that were doing this stuff. Maybe I should learn from their mistakes and turn from this wicked stuff and serve God like my father Hezekiah did. But no, in verse 3 it says, For he built again the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down. And he reared up altars for Balaam and made groves. And worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. The host of heaven. Deuteronomy 4.19 shows you what those hosts of heaven are. Deuteronomy 4.19 says, And Unless thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God divided into all nations under the whole heaven. Quit worshiping the sun, moon, and the stars, and worship the God who made the sun, moon, and the stars. But Manasseh, he, he just couldn't stop worshiping those. And you know, the host of heaven can also refer to the spirit world. In 1 Kings twenty two nineteen, it says, And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And, you know, the stars picture angels. Sometimes angels are called stars, Revelation one twenty. So, Manasseh's probably hooked up with the wicked spirit world. You know, he's into all this occult stuff and he worshiped up all the host of heaven and served them. He probably hooked up with the spirit world just like the presidents and the kings of this world today are hooked up with the spirit world. There's no other way they could be so wicked. Also, he built altars in the house of the Lord whereof the Lord had said, in Jerusalem shall my name be forever. You know, you, you put... Altars for false gods in the house of the Lord. That's like moving a new partner in your house with your spouse still there. And the house being in their name. You know, you need to hold fast the Lord's name. You know, you need to have some reverence for his name. Manasseh didn't. You know, imagine moving a new spouse in your house while your spouse is still there. See, they were, he's committing spiritual adultery here. And verse 6, or verse 5, And he built altars for all the host of heaven and the two courts of the house of the Lord. Just straight blasphemy that he's committing here. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. This valley, this valley southeast to the temple, is where they worship Moloch and where they burn children. 2 Kings 23.10 2 Chronicles 28.3, Jeremiah 7.31, Jeremiah 32.35, Jeremiah 19.6, Psalm 106.37. They sacrificed to devils there. They worshipped all the host of heaven. 
doing all these forbidden practices, all that stuff we mentioned in Deuteronomy earlier. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also, he observed times and used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Imagine you making the God who keeps the sun burning angry. I don't want to make him angry. And it says that he set a carved image. Remember that image that we talked about he made out of the trees of the grove? See, it's a carved image. He would have carved it or had somebody carve it. And the idol which he had made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Picturing the placement of sinful things in your temple. See, your body's the temple, as I said. That's, that's a picture of that, putting something unclean like that in your temple. And he says, Neither will I any more remove the foot of Israel from out of the land which I have appointed for your fathers, so that they will take heed to do the all that I have commanded them, according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. See, once the Jews accept Jesus Christ after the tribulation, he's never going to remove them from the land again. But back here, they, they would get removed from the land by not keeping the commandments, by being led to do all this wicked stuff that Manasseh had let them in. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and do worse than the heathen, whom the Lord had destroyed before children of Israel. So you see, Manasseh is, has got so much wrath on him because he's not just leading himself astray. He's leading the entire nation astray. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. They wouldn't listen. Now, here's the twist. Verse 11. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns. You know what that reminds me of? A thorn in the flesh. Like I said, if you don't... And... You know, if you don't serve the Lord, he's going to raise up a thorn to get you back to him. And he may even raise up a thorn just to make sure you stay close to him. Maybe you haven't done bad, and he's just giving you the thorn so you don't get exalted above measure like he did with Paul. But he, they took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. And that's what sin will do to you. It's going to have you in thorns and it's going to bind you. And the thorns will humble you and bring you back to God. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. There's the twist. You didn't see that coming. A guy that was doing child sacrifices and everything else has been humbled and brought back to God. God can take the meanest, evilest, backslid person you ever seen and and have them in such pain that they come back to God and that they repent. And that's what Manasseh did. When he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God. You know, he knew who the right God was. I don't know if he got in there and started remembering Hezekiah and maybe the Hezekiah teaching in the Bible, maybe from the from as a child he knew the Holy Scriptures like Timothy and just discarded them all of his life. But he knew something. I mean, there wasn't nobody there giving it to him. So he had to have something brought back to his remembrance. And see, that's the importance of getting the Word of God in your kids because they're going to be at this point one day. And if they ain't got the Word of God in them, then how are they going to remember the Lord their God? How is it? How are they going to talk to God that they they don't even familiar with? And he humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers, and prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him, and heard his supplication. God heard Manasseh praying. God listened to Manasseh after all the evil, wicked stuff that he did. 
So you mean to tell me that you think you're too bad for God to listen to or you're too bad for God to save? You ain't done what Manasseh's did. I guarantee it. If you did what Manasseh's done, you'd be locked up. You'd be in prison right now. And even if you are, he heard Manasseh, he can hear you. And prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him, and heard his supplication, and brought him again to Jerusalem, into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. There's the twist. The most evil king gets right with the Lord and becomes a good king. Now, it doesn't change the fact he's already messed things up majorly. You know, you you get saved and you get changed, which Manasseh, obviously, Old Testament scenario, he doesn't have all the things that go along with our salvation. You know, he didn't get spiritually circumcised. He wasn't born again. He didn't have the sealing of the Holy Spirit to a day of redemption. We got so much more than what he got. And look how he turned things around. Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. Now, after this, he built a wall without the city of David on the west side of Gahan in the valley, even to the entering in at the fish gate, and compassed about Ophel, and raised it up a very great height, and put captains in war in all the fenced cities of Judah. And he, he, he starts re building everything back up. Most likely, when they came in there and got him, they had to bust some of them walls down to get in there and get him. And it says in the valley, even to the entering in at the fish gate, where they brought fish from Joppa and sold them. You see, the, these walls probably got knocked down. He's building them back up. He's trying to turn things around. And he, now look at verse 15. And he took away the strange gods. He turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. He took them away. He took away the strange gods and the idol out of the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem and cast them out of the city. He got, he's, he's getting rid of these gods. And he repaired the altar of the Lord and sacrificed their own peace offerings and thank offerings and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. Nevertheless, the people did sacrifice still in the high places, yet unto the Lord their God only. So, he's leading them back to the Lord, but they still got those high places. And you couldn't just sacrifice anywhere you wanted to. Deuteronomy 12, 13 through 14 shows you he, the Lord's got a specific place that he wanted them to sacrifice and worship. But Manasseh, he turned things around. That's a huge twist. You didn't see that coming. You know, you could turn things around. Manasseh turned things around. And it says, Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and his prayer unto his God and the words of the seers that spake to him. You know, the words of the seers. You know, the seers are prophets. The seers that spake to him in the name of the Lord God of Israel, behold, they are written in the book of of the kings of Israel. And we done went through that. Second Kings 21. His prayer also. And how God was entreated of him. And all his sin and his trespass. And the places wherein he built high places. And set up groves and graven images. Before he was humbled. I like that. Before he was humbled. See the Lord had to humble him. Maybe you're like Manasseh. You ain't been humbled yet. You better humble yourself before God humbles you. Humble yourself now. Learn from Manasseh's mistakes. You're not nothing special. You need to get humbled. It says, Behold, they are written among the sayings of the seers. His sin is still talked about because, you know, he, didn't ha he doesn't have what we had. He wasn't spiritually circumcised, born again. He didn't have imputed righteousness. So here his, his sins still talked about, even though he got right with the Lord. And his sins talked about in other places. It says, So Manasseh slept with his fathers, and they buried him in his own house, and Ammon his son reigned in his stead. But it says, look at that in verse 19 where it says, Behold, they are written among the sayings of the seers. 
And you know, the Bible has books cited in it that aren't, that are not actually in the scripture. Let me name off some of those to you just for kicks. It says, uh, there, it talks about the book of Jasher in Joshua 10, 13 and 2 Samuel 1, 18. It talks about the acts of Solomon in 1 Kings eleven forty one. It talks about the prophecy of Abijah and the visions of Ido the seer and the book of Nathan the prophet in 2 Chronicles 9, 29. It talks about the book of Gad in 1 Chronicles 29, 29. It talks about the book of Shema Shemaiah, that's S-H-E-M-A-I-A-H -A -A in 2 Chronicles 12, 15. It talks about the acts of Uzziah in 26, 20, in, um, 2 Chronicles 26, 22. It talks about an epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 5, 9. It talks about an epistle to the Laodiceans by Paul in Colossians 4, 16. It mentions some writings of Enoch in Jude 14. And it mentions another epistle of John in 3 John 9. And it mentions other gospels in Luke 1, 1 through 2. So there's other books cited in Scripture that are not actually in Scripture. That doesn't mean that there's lost books of the Bible. God had, God made sure that everything that He wanted in the Bible is preserved to us now these 66 books he confirms that with the 66 books in isaiah that line up with the 66 books of the bible but manasseh i love the twist at the end he turned things around maybe you're you've turned from god you're living like the devil god's gonna hear you if you're not saved, you need to call on the name of the Lord right now and get saved. If you're saved and you've just been living wicked all this time, you need to call on the Lord. And if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Get right back into fellowship. Don't wait until God has to humble you. Humble yourself. Now we're going to get into the twist at the end of Manasseh's life. And I love a good twist. Second Kings 21 didn't tell you about it. That's the value of reading the whole thing because you wouldn't have known about this if you didn't read Second Chronicles 33. So we're going to go through Second Chronicles 33 and get more detail. Second Chronicles 33, 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. And we done talked about that awfully young guy born three years after Hezekiah's recovery and in the seventh year of Hezekiah's reign. And obviously he didn't have much time with Hezekiah because Hezekiah died when he was young. And maybe his, his mother, Hephzibah, just didn't lead him the right way. I don't know. But um, if you don't count Athaliah, he's the 13th king of Israel. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast up before the children of Israel. And you would think that, you would, he would think, hey, you know, the Lord killed all these heathen nations that were doing this stuff. Maybe I should learn from their mistakes and turn from this wicked stuff and serve God like my father Hezekiah did. But no, in verse 3 it says, For he built again the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down. And he reared up altars for Balaam and made groves. And worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. The host of heaven. Deuteronomy 4.19 shows you what those host of heaven are. Deuteronomy 4.19 says, And Unless thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God divided into all nations under the whole heaven. Quit worshiping the sun, moon, and the stars, and worship the God who made the sun, moon, and the stars. But Manasseh, he, he just couldn't stop worshiping those. And you know, the host of heaven can also refer to the spirit world. In 
1 Kings 22, 19, it says, And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And, you know, the stars picture angels. Sometimes angels are called stars, Revelation 1, 20. So, Manasseh's probably hooked up with the wicked spirit world. You know, he's into all this occult stuff. And he worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. He probably hooked up with the spirit world just like the presidents and the kings of this world today are hooked up with the spirit world. There's no other way they could be so wicked. Also, he built altars in the house of the Lord, whereof the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. You know, you you put altars for false gods in the house of the Lord, that's like moving a new partner in your house with your spouse still there and the house being in their name. You know, you need to hold fast the Lord's name. You know, you need to have some reverence for his name. Manasseh did it. You know, imagine moving a new spouse in your house while your spouse is still there. See, they were, he's committing spiritual adultery here. And verse 6, or verse 5, And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven and the two courts of the house of the Lord. Just straight blasphemy that he's committing here. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. This valley, this valley southeast to the temple, is where they worship Moloch and where they burn children. 2 Kings 23.10 2 Chronicles 28.3, Jeremiah 7.31, Jeremiah 32.35, Jeremiah 19.6, Psalm 106.37. They sacrificed to devils there. They worshipped all the host of heaven, doing all these forbidden practices. All that stuff we mentioned in Deuteronomy earlier. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also, he observed times and used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Imagine you making the God who keeps the sun burning angry. I don't want to make him angry. And it says that he set a carved image. Remember that image that we talked about he made out of the trees of the grove see it's a carved image he would have carved it or had somebody carve it and the idol which he had made in the house of god of which god had said to david and to solomon his son in this house and in jerusalem which i have chosen before all the tribes of israel will i put my name forever picturing the placement of sinful things in your temple see your body's the temple as i said that's, that's a picture of that, putting something unclean like that in your temple. And he says, Neither will I any more remove the foot of Israel from out of the land which I have appointed for your fathers, so that they will take heed to do the all that I have commanded them, according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. See, once the Jews accept Jesus Christ after the tribulation, he's never going to remove them from the land again. But back here... They, they would get removed from the land by not keeping the commandments, by being led to do all this wicked stuff that Manasseh had let them in. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before children of Israel. So you see, Manasseh is has got so much wrath on him because he's not just leading himself astray. He's leading the entire nation astray. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. They wouldn't listen. Now, here's the twist. Verse 11. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns. You know what that reminds me of? A thorn in the flesh. Like I said, if you don't... And... You know, if you don't serve the Lord, he's going to raise up a thorn to get you back to him. And he may even raise up a thorn just to make sure you stay close to him. 
Maybe you haven't done bad, and he's just giving you the thorn so you don't get exalted above measure like he did with Paul. But he, they took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. And that's what sin will do to you. It's going to have you in thorns, and it's going to bind you. And the thorns will humble you and bring you back to God. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. There's the twist. You didn't see that coming. A guy that was doing child sacrifices and everything else has been humbled and brought back to God. God can take the meanest, evilest, backslid person you ever seen and, and have them in such pain that they come back to God and that they repent. And that's what Manasseh did. When he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God. You know, he knew who the right God was. I don't know if he got in there and started remembering Hezekiah and maybe the Hezekiah teaching in the Bible. Maybe from the from as a child he knew the Holy Scriptures like Timothy and just discarded them all his life. But he knew something. I mean, there wasn't nobody there giving it to him. So he had to have something brought back to his remembrance. And see, that's the importance of getting the Word of God in your kids because they're going to be at this point one day. And if they ain't got the Word of God in them, then how are they going to remember the Lord their God? How is it? How are they going to talk to God that they, they don't even familiar with? And he humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him. And he was entreated of him and heard his supplication. God heard Manasseh praying. God listened to Manasseh after all the evil, wicked stuff that he did. So you mean to tell me that you think you're too bad for God to listen to or you're too bad for God to save? You ain't done what Manasseh's did. I guarantee it. If you did what Manasseh's done, you'd be locked up. You'd be in prison right now. And even if you are, he heard Manasseh, he can hear you. And prayed unto him and he was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. There's the twist. The most evil king gets right with the Lord and becomes a good king. Now, it doesn't change the fact he's already messed things up majorly. You know, you you get saved and you get changed, which Manasseh, obviously, Old Testament scenario, he doesn't have all the things that go along with our salvation. You know, he didn't get spiritually circumcised. He wasn't born again. He didn't have the sealing of the Holy Spirit to a day of redemption. We got so much more than what he got. And look how he turned things around. Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. Now, after this, he built a wall without the city of David on the west side of Gahan in the valley, even to the entering in at the fish gate, and compassed about Ophel, and raised it up a very great height, and put captains in war in all the fenced cities of Judah. And he, he, he starts re building everything back up. Most likely, when they came in there and got him, they had to bust some of them walls down to get in there and get him. And it says, In the valley, even to the entering in at the fish gate, where they brought fish from Joppa and sold them. You see, the, these walls probably got knocked down. He's building them back up. He's trying to turn things around. And he Now look at verse 15. And he took away the strange gods. He turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. He took them away. He took away the strange gods and the idol out of the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem and cast them out of the city. He got, he's, he's getting rid of these gods. And he repaired the altar of the Lord and sacrificed their own peace offerings and thank offerings and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. Nevertheless, the people did sacrifice still in the high places, yet unto the Lord their God only. So, 
he's leading them back to the Lord, but they still got those high places. And you couldn't just sacrifice anywhere you wanted to. Deuteronomy 12, 13 through 14 shows you he, the Lord's got a specific place that he wanted them to sacrifice and worship. But Manasseh, he turned things around. That's a huge twist. You didn't see that coming. You know, you could turn things around. Manasseh turned things around. And it says, Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and his prayer unto his God and the words of the seers that spake to him. You know, the words of the seers. You know, the seers are prophets. The seers that spake to him in the name of the Lord God of Israel, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel. And we done went through that, Second Kings 21. His prayer also, and how God was entreated of him, and all his sin and his trespass, and the places wherein he built high places, and set up groves and graven images, before he was humbled. I like that, before he was humbled. See, the Lord had to humble him. Maybe you're like Manasseh. You ain't been humbled yet. You better humble yourself before God humbles you. Humble yourself now. Learn from Manasseh's mistakes. You're not nothing special. You need to get humbled. It says, Behold, they are written among the sayings of the seers. His sin is still talked about because... You know, he, didn't have, he doesn't have what we had. He wasn't spiritually circumcised, born again. He didn't have imputed righteousness. So here, his, his sins still talked about, even though he got right with the Lord. And his sins talked about in other places. It says, So Manasseh slept with his fathers, and they buried him in his own house. And Ammon, his son, reigned in his stead. But it says, look at that in verse 19, where it says, Behold, they are written among the sayings of the seers. And you know, the Bible has books cited in it that aren't that are not actually in the scripture let me name off some of those to you just for kicks it says uh there it talks about the book of jasher in joshua ten thirteen and second samuel one eighteen. it talks about the acts of solomon in first kings eleven forty one. it talks about the prophecy of abijah and the visions of Ido the seer and the book of nathan the prophet in 2 Chronicles 9.29, it talks about the book of Gad in 1 Chronicles 29.29. 29. It talks about the book of Shemaiah, that's S-H-E-M-A-I-A-H in 2 Chronicles 12.15. It talks about the acts of Uzziah in, 26, 20, in um, 2 Chronicles 26.22. It talks about an epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 5, 9. It talks about an epistle to the Laodiceans by Paul in Colossians 4, 16. It mentions some writings of Enoch in Jude 14. And it mentions another epistle of John in 3 John 9. And it mentions other gospels in Luke 1, 1 through 2. So there's other books cited in Scripture that are not actually in Scripture. That doesn't mean that there's lost books of the Bible. God had, God made sure that everything that He wanted in the Bible is preserved to us now. These 66 books, He confirms that with the 66 books in Isaiah that line up with the 66 books of the Bible. But Manasseh, I love the twist at the end, He turned things around. Maybe you're, you've turned from God. You're living like the devil. God's going to hear you. If you're not saved, you need to call on the name of the Lord right now and get saved. If you're saved and you've just been living wicked all this time, you need to call on the Lord. And if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Get right back into fellowship. Don't wait until God has to humble you. Humble yourself.